You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop. Glad you're with us tonight to um, study the Bible together. And I think tonight, I hope it will be a lesson that will cause you to think about some things as we go through the next few weeks and months uh, in our society. Uh, maybe the things that are happening in our society will make you think about the Bible is what we, what we hope to accomplish with this tonight. But before we begin, we want to give our contact information. Uh, you can reach me at 276-340-2653, wordfromlord at gmail.com. And we are uh, glad to meet with you and have a Bible study with you. Contact me by email, Bible study that way. However, it wants, however you want to do it, we'll be glad to do that. We're giving away uh, <clears throat> free books, uh, a muscle and a shovel. Mark, do you have a copy of that? Uh, a Muscle and Shovel, it's, a, it's an excellent book. If you'd like a copy of that book, uh, it's, it's easy reading, uh, but it's a story about a man that um, has, uh, was struggling to find the truth, looking for the truth, and uh, the struggles that he went through, the internal struggles, you might say, of realizing that what he'd been taught all his life and what he had believed all his life was not in the Bible, and uh, a very uh, compelling uh, book, and so I hope that you'll read that. If you'd like a copy of that, we'll be glad to give that to you. Just give me a call, and we'll uh, get in touch with you and uh, get that to you. So, uh, well, tonight, we're going to be talking about elections. You know, elections are going on. We've got the electioneering starts from, from uh, caucuses to, I don't know, primaries, um, Ads are running all over the place. You see signs all up and down the road. Uh, the uh, mudslinging starts, you know. It's uh, promises, I'm going to do this. I'm going to build a wall. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to give everybody free, free this, whatever. I mean, all kinds of promises are going on because of the candidate. So who is going to be elected? I mean, who, who, who are you going to vote for? Who are you going to elect? Uh, is it the person that promises you Everything, someone said, well, you can't compete with Santa Claus. If a politician comes along and promises everything, uh, they don't say how they're going to pay for it, but they're going to promise everything. Well, they probably going to get a lot of votes because everybody wants free stuff. But who are you going to vote for? Who, who is uh, going to be your elected official? Well, I'm not really concerned about that tonight. That's really not what we're talking about, but we are going to be talking about the election. We are going to be talking about an election, if you will, and hopefully you are going to be running. Hopefully you're going to be <coughs> one of the individuals that gets elected. We'll just say it that way. Now, what do you mean by that, James? What are we talking about? Well, I'm talking about a, 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 an election that is of greater importance than the election of the uh, person to the highest office in uh, the United States. It's, it's more important than who's uh, president. It's more important than who's in the Senate and who's in the Congress. What we're talking about is election uh, of God, being elected by God. That's what we're talking about. It's, it's a more important one. Look at this. In Colossians 3 and verse 12, <clears throat> Colossians 3 and verse 12, I want you to listen to what Paul says, how, what he calls these Christians. He says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, and so forth. But notice, he calls them the elect of God. Now, why would he be calling individuals the elect of God? Have they, have they been elected? Have they been selected for something? I mean, how does a person become part of the elect? How did these folks in... Uh, a Colossae, how, how do they become part of the elect of God and to the point that Paul's going to talk about them? Is, it, is there something they have to do? Or is it just something that's arbitrarily done? I mean, how, how do you get elected to that position of being a child of God? Well, it can be either conditional or unconditional. It has to be one or the other. Now, some people are going to say, well, we do nothing. Some people say we do something. So let's see what the Bible has to say about it. 
But first of all, let's talk about the fact that you can, a person can be elected of God. We know that's the case because the Bible talks about the election of God. So here's the reality of election. The reality of elections is that it is something that the Bible does talk about. Now, what the Bible says about it is another different, is a different thing. Some individuals are going to tell us, well, this is what the Bible says about it, and we have to weed through what men think, and let's get to what the Bible says. But there is something in the Bible called an election. It's, it's a Bible term. It's a Bible doctrine. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, notice what Peter says now. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. So God has already selected or elected these individuals. God knows these individuals who are going to be elected. Well, maybe we should read on through the sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling, uh, unto the uh, obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you <coughs> and peace uh, be multiplied. So there is an election. You can be elected of God, but the question that we have to look at is what really does that mean? Well, when we're talking about election in the Bible, we need to understand that that word is very much like what we use when we're talking about electing a politician or electing someone to public office. It's the idea of being chosen, to choose, be chosen, uh, to made choice. All these terms that you find in the Bible, they are referring to this idea. They're referring to this idea of being selected or, or chosen by God. It actually means to, to uh, uh, be f uh, uh, favored. All right, so God elects some individuals. As a matter of fact, 44 times in the New Testament, you'll find this idea of elected or election or chosen by God. So it is, in fact, a reality. Now, here's what we need to consider. God chooses individuals or, in some cases, nations in order to do his will or to accomplish his task. Now, let me give you an illustration of how uh, God or how the Bible talks about election just to show you what it means to be chosen or selected or, or favored. Uh, in the Bible, we know that God does the choosing, all right? God does the choosing. Ephesians 1 and verse 4, Ephesians 1 and verse 4, and listen to what Paul says. Uh, he, he, he's talking to the, uh, the, the, the Christian at Ephesus, and he says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him uh, in love. So God does the choosing. So really, if we're talking about being elected, we want, we want to compare it to the, what's going on in our society today. God is the one. That, that, that is going to the polls. God's the one that's voting. God is the one that is, is choosing individuals, and he's going to choose who's going to be elected. And that's why the Bible talks about the elect of God. Romans 8 and verse 33. Romans 8 and verse 33. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God is the one who does the choosing. So now someone's going to stop right there and they're going to say, well, there it is. That's the answer to it right there. God does the choosing. So end of story, end of, end of book, period, close the book, let's go home. But friends, that's the danger that most people in the denominational world do. They stop after hearing just a little bit of what the Bible has to say about a matter and they think they've reached the whole conclusion. But I want you to notice something about God's choosing. God chooses for a reason, and his choosing is done uh, for a certain purpose. Now, in, uh, in regard to the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, God elected 
a certain people to bring the Messiah into the world. Now, today we hear people talk about all the time, well, Israel is God's chosen people. Well, we gotta, we got to protect Israel over here. You know, John Hagee is, he's a so-called Christian, but he, he just, oh, my, my, my Jewish brother over here. And uh, we've got to protect Israel. You know, well, look what's going on. Where everybody's going to attack Israel. We've got to defend Israel. Really, really, folks, is that really right? Are you really understanding what the Bible said about Israel? Are you just going off half cocked? Are you just, you know, missing what the Bible says about the election of Israel? Because notice this. God chose Israel for a purpose. In Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, Deuteronomy 7 and verse 6, here's what God says. He says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord uh, thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people uh, that are upon the face of the earth. So Israel was a special people that God selected, and they're going to be special and above all people upon the earth. Now, that doesn't mean that they were so righteous and, and uh, uh, um, I don't know, acceptable to God. It doesn't mean that they were faultless or sinless. It doesn't mean that that God just said, I love them and I'm just going to overlook everything they do. That's, that's not why God chose them. God did not choose them above all people on the face of the earth because of who they were. If we don't understand how God chose or why God chose Israel, we're not going to understand how God chooses men today. So let's look at, let's look at another verse here. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 14, and verse 2, Deuteronomy 14, verse 2, beginning verse 1, Ye are the children of the Lord your God. Ye should not cut yourselves and make uh, any uh, baldness between your eyes for the dead. Verse 2, notice this, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the about upon the earth. So God has chosen you above all these nations. But now notice, if you think that this is because Israel was so great and so precious and so uh, dear to God that because they were so righteous, then think again because notice what God says to them in Deuteronomy chapter 9. In Deuteronomy chapter 9 and beginning in verse 4, here's what it says. Speak not thou in thine heart. He's telling him, he said, don't say this in your heart. After the Lord hath, hath brought thee into, uh, out the land, of, after the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, for my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in uh, to possess this land. But for wickedness of these nations the Lord doth Drive them out from before thee. So when you come into the promised land, God's telling his people, when you come into the promised land, don't you say into your heart, don't say in your heart, well, it's because I'm so righteous God did this for me. God's doing this for me because I'm so good. No. He said, I'm doing this because the nations that are already in the land, they're wicked. I'm driving them out. I am exercising my justice and I am removing them because they have defiled the land. Now that's what he's saying to them. He said, I'm, I'm removing them out of the way because they have defiled the land. Not because you're righteous, but, but on the contrary, because they were so wicked. I moved them out and let you come in. Not because of your righteousness. He said, don't say that. Don't say that. Then he said, uh, not for thy righteousness, nor for thy uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God shall drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you get that? 
He says, Understand therefore that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it by thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. He said, The reason I'm giving you this land, not because you're righteous, not because you're upright, because you're a stiff-necked people. You're stubborn. You're rebellious. He said, But I'm giving it to you, number one, because this land is full of wicked people and they're going to be destroyed. But number two, it's because I made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I keep my promise, God said. That's why you were chosen. You were chosen not because of who you are, but you were chosen because I chose Abraham who was righteous. I chose Abraham who was a friend of God. He was my friend, God says. He was, I, I chose Abraham, and then I made a promise to him that I'm going to bless him, and his descendants shall be as the, the sand of the sea and the star of the sky, and in him shall all nations of the earth be blessed, which is a reference to Christ. He said, so I made a promise to Abraham, and therefore you get to benefit from that promise. But you're a wicked people. You're stiff, stiff-necked people always rebelling against me. But I, ca- I made a promise to Abraham. And therefore, this is why you're coming to the land. You see, God chose those people. He chose Israel, not because of who Israel was, but because he made a promise to Abraham. And so Israel was the nation, Israel was the nation that God chose out of all other nations to bring the Messiah into the world. Now, I don't know if you see my graphic there. It's not, not short, the colors aren't showing up too good. But if you've got all these nations in the world, God could have chosen any of them. He could have selected a person out of all these nations and said, all right, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and in you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. But you know what nation he did it to? He, did, he said it to Abraham, and his descendants became Israel. Now, friends, think about this. There were, there were a lot of nations already on the face of the earth when God made that promise to Abraham. There were a lot of nations that God could have chosen from. And surely there was some man that was, that was righteous in the eyes of God that God could have selected and said, you know what, I'll make a promise to you. But you know what, God didn't. He said, I just need one man. I need one man to make a promise to whom I can show my goodness and my mercy to so that I can bring my uh, mercy and my love to all the world by bringing my son to the world. And so I'm going to make a promise to Abraham. And so that is why Israel was chosen out of all nations. Israel was just a recipient of a promise that God made to Abraham. Now, now consider this. The on, once Christ came, once Christ came into the, into the world, the elect, the elected people of Israel, the elected nation of Israel, they were they, they served their purpose. Once Christ came into the world and became the, the blessing that he was supposed to be to all nations, Galatians 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds as of many, but of one uh, to thy seed, which is Christ. So when Christ came into the world, the the election status, the, the special status of Israel is finished. You know, you might say that they, they had a term limit. <laughs> you know, they were... They were they, they had no, served no, no more purpose. There was no more purpose for them to exist as a special people because the Christ came. Now, now God is going to choose people. He's going to elect people from all nations, not just Israel, not just Israel, but all nations can be elected in Christ. Now look at this. In Romans 9, Romans 9, verse 4, here's what, God, here's what Paul says. Paul says, 
Uh, well, let's back up to verse 3, I guess, maybe. He said, If I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now, Paul's recognizing that he has some brethren in the flesh, and he has a relationship with some folks in a spiritual sense. And he said, I'm talking about my physical brethren. He said, I wish I could be a curse from Christ for my brethren according to the flesh so that they could be saved. Why, Paul? Verse 4. He says, who are Israelites? I'm talking about Israelites. Fleshly Israel. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service and service of God and the promises. He said, God made the promises to them. They are the recipients. They, they uh, uh, were, were told they could be adopted. They're the first ones. They have first dibs on it, you might say. But just because they were the children of Abraham and just because they were the elected nation to bring the Messiah did not mean that they automatically were elected to be saved in Christ. That's, that's not the way it works. That's not the way the election works. Yes, the promises were given to them. They were given the law, but they still had to comply with the election process in order to get into Christ. Because now all nations of the earth are going to be blessed in Christ. All families of the earth can be blessed in Christ. And that's why we're saying when the election of Israel took place, it was to bring them to Christ. Now, now Israel, there's no, no special Israel today, not physically, no special physical Israel today. But there are elected individuals who are in Christ. That's, that's what we're talking about. So the question we need to discuss then is, how do, I, how do I become one of these elected? How do I become one of the elect that are in Christ? Because that's where the election is. Right? That's where God has chosen people. It's where he put people in Christ. Look what Paul says. In, continue on in Romans uh, 9. He says, uh, verse. let's say, look at verse 5. He says, Who's are, uh, whose are the fathers? Uh, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless forever, all men. Now let's look at verse 6. He says, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Now did you get that, friend? Paul said, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. What? I thought Israel was God's special people. Well, physical Israel was. But now if you're elected in Christ, now we're talking about a spiritual Israel. A spiritual Israel. And so God has elected of all nations, including physical Israel, God elected out of all nations, including physical Israel, Individuals who would be elected in Christ. And if you're in Christ, then guess what? You are the spiritual Israel of God. Now there's a different Israel. You see, the picture was God chose Israel, the nation, to bring the Messiah into the world. The Messiah came to the world, and now all nations could come and be elected in Christ and make up a spiritual Israel. Isn't that better? But see, the problem that, that many people have is they can't get over the physical Israel. But Paul said, all those people of Israel, they're not Israel. They are not all of Israel who are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham. Not, it's, it's not because they're the seed of Abraham uh, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So it's not about their physical genealogy. It's not about their heritage, their bloodline, because they're descendants of Abraham. That, that's not what makes them spiritual Israel. That's not what makes them elected. He says, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, 
These are not the children of God. What? I thought Israel was God's chosen people. Well, they were for a point in time. When the Messiah came into the world, right, and established the church, guess what? Israel, the physical Israel of God, they got relegated back to you are just a nation like everybody else. You have to obey the gospel just like everybody else. You, Israel, you're just like the Gentiles. <gasps> yep, just like the Gentiles. You have to obey the same gospel that the Gentiles obey in order to be the elect of God. So Paul says, that is to say, they which are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Now, individuals, individuals who have obeyed the gospel, they're the ones that are counted as the elect of God. They're the ones counted as the ones who are specially chosen in Christ to be the elect of God. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and there shall be, uh, and, and Sarah shall have a son. So God made a promise to Abraham and Sarah and Isaac was going to be the, the blessing. That is, the seed of promise was going to come and that's going to be Christ. And here is where individuals are elected today, elected in Christ. So when you talk about God choosing, God electing, it's being elected in Christ. Now, you might say, well, James, what do you do? How, are, how do you become one of these elected individuals in Christ? Well, that's a good question. So here we go. The requirements of our, our election, the requirements of election, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you become one of these elect? Well, some people say nothing. Some will say, well, there's nothing you can do to be elected. It's just all God's uh, arbitrary selection. If he likes you, if he, if he thinks you're special, I guess, I don't know, you, you're elected in, in God. Well, is that really what the Bible says? Some will say, no, you don't do anything. For example, here's the Primitive Baptist. Here's uh, something from the Primitive Baptist Church. The Primitive Baptists believe that uh, uh, God has determined beforehand all the people that are going to be uh, selected, elected. Here's their statement. They said, we believe in the election of a definite number of human family to eternal salvation and that God made choice of them in Christ before the foundation of the world, not because of anything he foresaw in man, but for his own good pleasure. Now listen to that. For his own good pleasure, God said, any, many, mighty, mo, you're elected. You know, rock, paper, scissors, you're elected. I don't know, what, hot potato, hot potato, you're elected. You know, ring around the rosy. I, I don't know how, how, how do they think God chose them? God just arbitrarily came up because it's for his good pleasure, is what they say. Now notice, they go on to say this. They say, the doctrine of unconditional election. All right, this is their teaching, the doctrine of unconditional election. Uh, God has shown in his word from eternity uh, past, he has elected some sinners to be saved from sin and the condemnation that is justly deserved by all purely on the account of his gracious mercy and love. Now wait a minute. Read that again. Read that again. God has shown in his word that from eternity past he has elected some sinners to be saved from sin and the condemnation that is justly deserved by all purely on the account of his gracious mercy and love. God's gracious mercy and love has arbitrarily just selected some sinners to be saved from what is deserved by all. Does that really sound fair to you? Does that really sound like justice? Does that really sound like mercy? Everybody deserves to die, but I'm just going to choose you from the foundation of the world. Before the world was even began, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose Mark and not James. Really? Uh, sounds real just to me, doesn't you? 
Friends, is that really the kind of God you want to serve? No, that's the kind of God the primitive Baptist wants you to believe in. That God just said, whoop, yep. You know, every third person that comes into the world, I guess, I don't know, maybe it's every seventh person. We've got to use a, you know, a good uh, uh, biblical number here. Every seventh person that comes into the world is, is saved. I don't know. Is that how God does it? Is it? See, they can't tell you how he elects them. He just, he just chooses them. Well, friends, if you study the Bible, you'll know how God elects them. Go on, let's continue reading what they say here. So God just chose people because of his good, mercy, gracious mercy and love to save some people that, uh, from the wrath that is owed by all. Not because, of any unfor not because of any foreseen merits or acts in those sinners. And the scriptures teach that it is God's sovereign will alone that has determined the recipients of that salvation. So God's sovereign will. That, what that means, friends, is God gets to choose if you're saved or if you're lost simply because he's God, you know. Yeah, I get to do it. Why? Because I'm God. You, see ya, you come with me. You're gone, you're with me. Again, how does he arbitrarily choose that? Is that how he elects it? Is that how he elects a person? He chooses somebody just arbitrarily? And his grace and mercy saves them? Well, I'd like to talk to the people that he condemns. Yeah, it doesn't seem real fair, does it? Now listen, friends, here's the consequence of this. Here's the consequence of this. The Bible says about God and his election, if you will, in 1 Timothy 2, in verse 4, 1 Timothy 2, <clears throat> in verse 4, says that God will have all men to be saved and come unto a knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. Now, how does that compare with what the Primitive Baptist statement about election says? They said God arbitrarily just saved a few because, hey, it's just, he's, he's good, he's merciful, and he just arbitrarily did it because he's God. But this says God will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Now, there's only, you know, there's only a, a one way really to get around this. And that's the way that Mr. Uh, uh, Ernest Hopkins says it. Mr. Ernest Hopkins says, well, what this means is it's wrong. <laughs> this is wrong. The Bible is wrong because primitive Baptist doctrine is right. Now, I'm sorry, friends, I'm going to take the Bible. So when the primitive Baptists say God is merciful and loving, he's going to save some, and then I read the Bible and it says God wants all men to be saved. God doesn't want anybody to be lost. Wouldn't that be true love? I don't want anybody to be lost. Now some may be lost because of things they do, but God doesn't want anybody to be lost. Look, God would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is long suffering, not willing that any should perish. So God's not willing that any should perish. He wants all men to be saved to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, friends, that just can't, that just can't uh, be right if what the primitive Baptists are saying is right. But yet, that's what the Bible says, so I'm going to go with the Bible. Now, look, look at the consequences here. If, if it is God's sovereign will alone that determines the recipients of salvation, now that's what they said. They said it's God's sovereign will alone that determines who gets to be saved and who is lost. Well, if that's true, then salvation is universal. That means everybody gets to be saved. Because God wants all men to be saved. And salvation is based upon God's sovereign will alone. Man didn't have any choice in the matter. 
So God's sovereign will is to save individuals. The Bible says that God wants all men to be saved. Now you've got a problem here. If you believe God has only picked a few, but it's his sovereign will that saves individuals, well, the Bible says his will is that all men repent and obey the gospel. They come to knowledge of the truth. See? There's not going to be anybody lost when you put the primitive Baptist doctrine together with the Bible. They've gone from God saving some because he just arbitrarily wanted them saved to saving everybody. Now, that sounds like Billy Graham, doesn't it? Well, you don't even have to know the name of Jesus. You're going to be, you can be saved. See where we go to, friends? When you don't listen to the Bible and you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you go from one extreme to the other. God's going to save somebody just because, and there's nothing they can do about it, and he's going to condemn some people, and there's nothing they can do about it. And then you swing over here to, well, God's going to have to save everybody. Well, friends, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says some are going to be saved and some are going to be lost. Matthew chapter 7 Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You know what those, those two verses tell me? They tell me that universalism is wrong, that God's not going to save everybody. And contrary to what a lot of people believe, they think, well, I love God, so therefore he's going to save me. No, God's not going to, the majority of people are going to be lost. Not because, not because of what the primitive Baptists say, that God has arbitrarily chose some people to be saved and everybody else is lost, but because God has chosen a way to save mankind and men, whether they choose to accept it and be saved, or they'll choose to reject it, and they'll be lost. Now, someone says, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's right. Well, if God arbitrarily, if he just chooses and selects someone to be saved, like the statement we just read from the primitive Baptist, then that makes God a respecter of persons. That makes God a respecter of persons. Now, Peter tells us in Acts 10, in verse 34, Acts 10 and verse 34. Here he is at Cornelius' house. He says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but that in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, Peter, Peter, you got it wrong, see. A person cannot work righteousness. A person can't do that. God has to do it for him. No. Friends, I'm going to take the Bible. Why don't people just take the Bible and then throw out all these man-made doctrines that confuse us on what it takes really to be elected? How to become one of the elected of God. Uh, go ahead and let's go and put the phone lines up if we could, Matt. All right, so... So to be one of the elected, to be one of the elected then, it's not, it's not some arbitrarily uh, picking and choosing on God's part. God did not elect the man. God doesn't choose who is going to be saved uh, on an individual basis, but rather he elected the plan by which man can be saved. He elected the plan or he chose the plan by which man can then become a child of God. Now, how do I know that? Well, let's look. Let's look at, uh, let's go to Ephesians 1. I'm maybe getting ahead of myself here. I am. So let's don't do that. Let's don't do that. Let's go to uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with the corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by your father, traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a 
lamb without blemish and without spot. Verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. Now listen, mm -hmm. that is the Savior of the plan. That's the Savior of the plan. God selected a Savior before the world began, so man then can be saved according to that plan. All right, there you go. All right, call back and we'll take your phone call. All right, now notice. So that's the Savior. That's the Lord. That's, that's the sacrifice for man's election. But now let's look at the scriptures that have the plan for man's election. In verse 21, continue reading there, 1 Peter 1, verse 21, notice what he says. He says, who by him, that's by Christ, who by him do believe in God that raised him, Christ, up from the dead and gave him, Christ, glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Wait a minute. Peter just says that man has a part in their salvation. Seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, you mean man has to do something? Man can, can participate in the process? That's exactly right. How do you purify your souls? By obeying the truth. You obey the truth and that's how you purify your souls. How are you? I thought you purified by the blood of Christ. You are. You are. The blood of Christ was part of the plan that God had from the beginning. Notice, it was always in God's mind to sacrifice His Son, for the sins of the world, that all nations by him might be blessed. God didn't select the individuals who are going to be recipients of that sacrifice. He foreordained the sacrifice, and then he put the plan in place so that man, so that man could be freed from his sins if he'd simply obey. All right, here we go. You're on the word from the Lord. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, listen, I, I believe in everything you're saying, and I think you're doing wonderful. I mean, I, 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 to me, it seems amazing just what you're you're uh, showing us on the screen and everything. But in Revelation, does it have a size given for heaven? Is it something like 13 acres or something cute? It's cubits by cubits. And, um, I, I don't remember the exact verse. I mean, there's a description of it, but it's not a, that's not a literal size. That's not a literal size. Oh, okay. It's, 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 all, it's just a picture, all right? Revelation 1.1 1, 1 says these things were signified. So there's a lot of symbols in Revelation, a lot of, lot of pictures. Picture word, you might say. Okay? I, I, I thought, you know, if, if he had revealed a certain size, then he would already know who was going to heaven. But I'm glad you right. explained that to me. Right. No, he hasn't, right. he hasn't selected who all is going to be there. Otherwise, Christ would have only died for a select number, a select group of people, which some people believe that. But... The Bible says Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. So it has to be that anybody, whosoever will, can, can be a recipient of the sacrifice that Christ made. They can benefit from that. It's not just open to a selected group of people, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> but...
Right. Church. Um, it's I, good. I can't remember yeah, exactly. Roman, Romans 8.33, Who shall lay anything to the, to the uh, charge of God's elect for his God that justifies? God, uh, do, yeah. God, God does justify. Part, yeah. God does justify, but the question is, how does he justify? Since that, the foundation, first it's got sense of the, about the foundation. Okay. Uh, first, uh, that, first Peter. That, that's one that I'm that confuses me. Okay. Uh, was that first? That's First Peter one two, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Yes. All right. So, but uh, that that's what I'm getting to. I'm fixing to get to that. I'm fixing to explain how we are elected according to the foreknowledge of God. All right. Again, God foreknew the plan, not the man. He foreknew how man was going to be elected. He, he foreknew how he was going to save mankind, not the individuals that are going to be saved. Okay, thank you. you with, thank okay. you very much. All right, you're welcome. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right, so you know, I'm glad to clear that up. Yeah, see, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God well, it doesn't, P Peter's not saying what God foreknew. You just have to assume, you're assuming that, well, God, God foreknew who was going to be elect. No, it just says we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Here, here is what God foreknew. Look at this. God foreknew the plan. Now look, this is God's plan. Save people, that's the elect, in Christ. Now look, Ephesians 1, all right. Let me get this up here and we'll get to our phone. All right. You want to work from the Lord? You want to work from the Lord? All right. All right. <clears throat> now notice this. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Ephesians 1, 3. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All right, now that's the key. In Christ. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't say that God chose us before the foundation of the world. It says it chose us in him. That is, God chose our elected people who are in Christ. Now, the Bible is going to tell us how to get into Christ. So if I get into Christ, now I have become one of those chosen individuals in Christ. I have become one of those individuals who God has chosen in Christ. God said, I'm going to put the elect in Christ. And he said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put, I'm going to put the chosen in Christ. That's my plan. And that plan was from the found, before the foundation of the world. It was always God's plan that the saved, the elect, be in Christ. All right? Again, the foreknowledge was how God was going to save man. It was the plan. It was not, I know the individuals who are going to be saved. All right? Now look at verse 5. He says, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Now, wait a minute. God has chosen how, who is going to become a child? No. He predestinated the plan. Right? Predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Again, how is he going to make us children? By Jesus Christ. According to the good pleasure of his will. This is how God has always determined to save mankind. By sending his son, making the, uh, making the plan available, and then individuals who obey, now they can become sons of God. They can become the elect who are in Christ. Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted. Where? In the beloved. Who's the beloved? Well, you may recall God spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. 
Christ is the beloved, and we are accepted in Christ. We are elect in Christ. We are chosen in Christ. So what we have to do is we have to get in Christ in order to be part of that elect. Now, what are the, what are the requirements for election? Well, that's pretty simple. Look at this. You have to hear the call. Remember, God is the one who elects. We read that. God is the one who elects. Look at Galatians 1 and verse 6. God is the one who calls. I marvel, Galatians 1 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. God is calling. God is calling. Now, how does God call? See, it always, it'll always serve you well, my friends, when you're reading the Bible to, to ask those questions, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and how. How does God call? How does God call individuals into the grace of Christ? Well, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when you obey the gospel, when you hear God's call, you hear the gospel. And when you obey God's call, when you heed that call, you might say, then you can become a child of God. You can become one of the elect. That's why in Hebrews 5 and verse 9, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, the writer says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Obedience is the key. Now, if God has arbitrarily selected someone, randomly picked individuals, uh, number one, that's not very loving. But number two, how is it then that someone can obey him? Or how can they disobey him? See, individuals who believe that God has pre-selected individuals randomly or however they figure he did it, they have to deal with the fact that God may condemn someone who is obeying him. God has to condemn someone who's obeyed him and done everything God said to do, but yet because God didn't, because God didn't choose you, you're going to be lost. And the guy out here who's sinning, he's out here getting drunk on, on a Friday night, and he's out here running the women, and he's doing drugs and everything else, everything illegal, immoral, and fattening. He's, he's, that's what he's doing. And yet God's going to say, well, I'm going to save you because I, you know, I chose you for the foundation of the world, so... Come on in, even though you're a heathen. Come on in. No, friends. That is not biblical election. Biblical election comes from obeying the gospel. You're on the word from the Lord. Uh, yes, James. It's uh, I again. Uh, can you explain to me something about accountability or if there's an age of accountability? Well, there's no specific age given in the Bible. But the Bible does say men and women. Men and women were committed to prison. When Paul, when Paul went and, and uh, persecuted the church in Acts chapter 8, uh, you, you recall that um, he went into houses. Verse 3, Saul made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed to prison. So it's... You know, there's no specific age, no age specified in the Bible, but it does specify men and women. So at some point, you're going to be accountable to God. And at some point, you recognize that, you know what, you're going, you're going to make a choice to be your own person. You're going to do your own thing. You're going, to, you're going to rebel. You're going to say, I'm going to do my own thing. And at that point, you need to start considering, you know what, ultimately, I'm still accountable to God. So I can't, you know, there's, the Bible doesn't say a specific age, but it does talk about individuals who are going to be accountable to God. And uh, it talks about the kind of people who were obedient to the gospel, men and women. You, you constantly say that phrase, men and women, men and women, men and women, not babies and infants and children. So uh, 
Uh, that's the best I can answer okay. on that. What about someone, maybe a child that's seven years old and is mentally uh, uh, affected or, or, you know, affected that it's not like other seven-year-olds, that maybe his parents think something's wrong with him. Is that how accountability is considered in the Bible? Well, or, or is the word accountability is in the Bible? Well, you know, you said it. You said a child, and I, and I'm saying the Bible says men and women. Acts eight and verse twelve, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. You said child. Now, you know, if there's if there's some kind of uh, you know, mental defect where that person is, is always a child. You know, they may be 50 years old and still a child. You know, we're, we're talking about uh, definitely mental capacity has to come into play here. Uh, one, reason why, one reason why children aren't accountable or amenable to the, the law of God, uh, the, the commands of God, are because they can't do the things that are required. You know, if they can't believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they, they can't comprehend that, that He's the Messiah, they, can't re, they don't have sins to repent of or they can't repent, you know, they have to confess. These are all things that are required. So if they can't do the requirements, then I, I don't see how they're going to be accountable. So, and that's, you know, that's the arguments against uh, baptizing infants and children, you know, yeah, so... Sir. So that's, that's where the accountability comes in, okay? Okay. All right. Thanks for your call. All right. So, all right. Uh, so we're talking about being, being one of the elect. Friends, the only thing that's keeping you from being one of the elect of God is whether you will obey the gospel. See, God has foreordained the way in which you can be one of the elect. One of, you can be one of the elect, and you can, you know, you can sit in some pretty high places. You know, people running for, we're talking about people running for the, the office of the presidency, the, the highest seat in the land. You know what? God has made it possible where you can sit in the, in the highest seat, that's, uh, in a seat that's higher than the highest in the land. We talked about this um, a couple weeks ago. But look at this. In Ephesians 2, in Ephesians 2, and, well, let me see here. Mistyped here. Uh, uh, having us, made us sit together in heavenly places. Here's for, uh, Ephesians 2, 6. He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Friends, it's always in Christ. In Christ is where you get to sit in the lofty places. In Christ is where all spiritual blessings are. In Christ is where you get to become a child of God. In Christ is where you become one of the selected or the elected or the chosen ones of God. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? Look at this. How do you get into Christ? Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Paul says, for as many, for you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So when you're baptized into Christ, that's when you put on Christ. That's when you become one of the elect. All right. We're right at the time. The phone lines light up right at the last minute. I appreciate you paying attention and uh, uh, listening, but I really don't know if I have time to take a call. So I do that, but I will talk to you off the air if you stay on the line. I'll talk to you off the air. Friend, listen, we're glad that you watched. We hope that this has helped you. Uh, we hope that you'll run for election. What is hindering you? Why tearest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling the name of the Lord. That's what Paul was told. So why don't you do that very thing? If we can assist you, we want to help you, here's how you can reach me at workmanlord.gmail.com, 276-340-2653. As always, thanks for watching. Always ask, what does the Bible say? 
And always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.